Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, and particularly, the bits in between. And welcome to the first interview of 2023. And, and this makes it the first interview of Series 5, which, considering where we started out from, that makes it incredibly scary, um, but really cool too. Before I introduce today's guest, there's a couple of housekeeping items I want to raise. So first up is if you're going to uh, Ergonomics and Human Practice Conference 2023, then that is the 25th and 26th of April at Kenilworth. Um, if you're not thinking of going, then I would strongly encourage you to go, because uh, it'd be fantastic to see you there. I'm going to be there, and no doubt we'll can find ourselves going down to the bar or something like that. Next up, podcasting in of itself is becoming more popular than ever. And more and more people are launching their own. If you go into any podcast directory now, or even on YouTube and things like that, loads and loads of people are bringing up their own channels. But there's not many, very, not very many human factors ones. Which you could argue is brilliant, because actually Connor's the market for us and the work I um, do with Nick Rowe on Human Factors Cast. Um, there's obviously a couple of human fa- other human factors fa- podcasts out there, but not many people know that much about them. So... But with that, if you if you follow the work that Nick and I do, then you know that really we're not here for shameless self-promotion, though I do do quite a lot of it. It's really about the whole point about what we're doing is sharing the word about human factors and what it is that we what it is that we do, what it is that we're getting up to, and sharing best practice. So if you're interested, or you're you think that you've got something to say, or you want to share your best practice, you want to share what you do do, do on a day to day basis. But you're unsure about how to start, what is involved, how it, you know, what do you have to spend, what gear do you have to have? And I'll give you a, um, a short pricey of that now. Actually, you don't need very much. If you've got a phone and a, and a microphone and a set of headphones, you can pretty much get, get, get things going. But if you'd like to have a chat about setting up your own podcast um, and having support to get it up and going, then drop me a line. I'd be more than happy to help. But getting back to the shameless self-promotion, which I said that I didn't do, um, I do need your help. Uh, if you have a moment whilst you're listening or watching to this, please do drop a like, subscribe to the channel, and or leave a five-star review on whatever platform you're using. That really helps others find us when they're scrolling podcast directories or YouTube channels looking for the next show or channel that they want to subscribe to and listen to. But additionally, what be more importantly, tell your colleagues, tell your friends, either face-to-face or through your social media. Do some uh, retweeting, do some sharing. Because um, your shares, your comments and likes are really, really encouraging. It, and it really shows us that we kind of, we're going down the right path and people are keen to hear um, what it is that I guess I've got to say. Right, that's enough sh- selfless shame promotion. This is not uh, self-promotion. This is not why you're here. The reason we're here is to talk today to today's guest, though I guess Stephen Chorog really needs no introduction. Whilst he's particularly well known for his work in the safety domain, his influence across much of the human factors world is hugely strong. Um, his website, Humanistic Systems, is a fantastic resource of thinking, not, in the, not just in the way of what he's got to say, but the way he clusters like-minded topics together. And it's also uh, signposting uh, a lot of his other roles, including being editor-in-chief of Hindsight Magazine for Eurocontrol. And a particularly poignant one for this podcast is the book he edited with Claire Williams, Human Factors and Ergonomics in Practice. And the reason, behind, the reason why I say that is because of really it starts in chapter six, where Stephen and Ron, uh, Ron Gant talk about human factors in the media. And when I read that, when I first got this book, which was around I think 2018, it started the cascade of thinking about what I can do to make a difference. Then when you go into chapter four, uh, sorry, part four of the book, it talks all about communication, um, but particularly on the, the the final chapter by Dominic Furness that describes the use of social media. I found that particularly helpful. And that laid some of the way for descri- for um, for, the, for the, where we are today, about how, why we got the podcast up and running and, and how we bounce it around uh, different media and profiles and trying to share different messages. Therefore, I'm hugely delighted and really, really excited to welcome him to the show today. So welcome, Stephen. Hi, Barry. Thanks for the invitation. Um, before we get into, um, I guess, the, the, the wider discussion, for people who don't necessarily know the the full breadth of stuff that you thought you get up to because you're you're a man of many hats and, and many talents. Could you give us a, a, a bit of an insight into your sort of your current roles and what you do on a day to day basis? Yeah, so I work for an organisation called Eurocontrol, which is a aviation 
organization with a variety of roles, um, coordination and uh, roles across Europe. Um, and primarily I'm involved in safety and human factors across a whole network of over 40 states um, around Europe, of course. Um, it's hard to say on a day-to-day -day basis because I think with any human factors practitioner that there is enormously so like probably on a week to week or month to month basis makes more sense the kinds of things i get involved in are um, as, as an example working with prosecutors with the judiciary um, um, and with aviation um, associations such as um, pilot associations air traffic controller associations working on um, how these two aspects of society might work together, might fit together. So how can safety and justice exist and be, be, be balanced? So do quite regular work on that several times a year, working with stakeholders from the judiciary and from aviation, uh, from all around Europe, you name the country, we come together several times a year. So that's one thing on what we call just culture. Um, Another that I've been doing for probably 10, 12 years is on safety culture, which is that involves going again, again it could be any particular country in Europe, and that has involved um, going to a particular air traffic organization and talking to staff after having issued questionnaires to hundreds or thousands of people, and then talking to sometimes hundreds of staff for a week or so. Um, and making conclusions based on what they say. So, so they're the kind of cultural elements that are organizational and national culture, let's say, with a safety emphasis. Um, other things that I do involve um, teaching. So teaching, for instance, systems thinking, um, lots of kind of qualitative research. So interviewing, um, workshops, um, and uh, Hindsight Magazine, which you've already mentioned, of which I'm the editor-in-chief. I also head up a, a co-chair, a, um, a group that we have called a Human Performance and, and a Safety, so Safety Human Performance Subgroup is the name. And that, again, brings in human performance safety people from all around Europe, from over potentially over 40 different states, and we meet a couple of times a year, and we meet online quite regularly as well. By a variety of high level coordination roles of that of that nature it's, it, i think the um the expression many things in many pies seems to be quite um quite appropriate um but if i can take you back to the beginning um why human factors how, how did you find what we find is meant a lot of people don't um find human factors straight away they they get into it how did you find it and wh how, why did you get involved yeah that's really easy um and it actually started in school um, when I was doing my GCSEs in the, you know, kind of the late 80s and up to 1990, one of the subjects was called design and communication. It was basically a design course. It was basically technical drawing, but with a bit of graphic design as well. And so I learned how to do technical drawing and learned the basics of graphic design. And uh, I really enjoyed that. But I enjoyed all of the humanities, um, especially English and art and as I learned then graphic design and technical drawing. So they were my main kind of interests at school. And I became interested in psychology at school, even though I didn't study it until A-level. And then once I studied psychology and communication and business studies at A-level, this was leading in a particular direction. So I was really interested in psychology, but also art. And I really grew up an artist um, as, a, as a kind of child and teenager I was more of a fine artist than anything so I was always drawing and painting um, and so I was quite interested at, th at that point of actually going into advertising until I really learned about what advertising was about and thought no I don't want to do that um, and, and so I studied psychology at university and very quickly I could see that there was a business application of psychology I hadn't really heard of human factors. I'd heard of ergonomics. Right. Um, and then it got to the final year of the degree. And this was in the old days when on a psychology degree, you had a huge amount of choice in what you studied. And now it's been quite rigidly put into boxes. Yeah. Uh, and a small number of boxes, I guess, to have more people in each class. 
but in those days, in my final year of the degree, I did courses in design, in um, human computer interaction, um, human factors, human relations at work, industrial psychology, and a couple of others that were all primarily around human factors and also humanistic psychology, which is also a great interest of mine. And so by this stage in my first degree, I studied a lot, quite a lot of human factors as well as classical cognitive psychology and so on. And that led me straight into a master degree in what was then work design and ergonomics, which was a Birmingham uh, master degree. It doesn't exist anymore. Okay. And um, yeah, so so that that was um, that 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 was a, a great degree at the time. And from there, that 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 was it. I knew I knew what I wanted to do, and um, I went on a summer placement in 1997 to NATS, which is the UK Air Traffic Control Organization. And that's that's really where it started off. And there, there was a great team led by Barry Kerwin at the time. They've had great teams ever since, actually, in human factors, great capability in human factors. Some of the strongest in the UK, I would say, for sure. And um, so, yeah, that's that's really what, what got me into it. And I've stayed in it pretty much ever since. That's There's not very many people I get to talk to who get inspired so at such a young age and basically be able to follow that all the way through. So that's really fantastic to hear that that was possible. And I guess that's, I, I don't know, it's a, it's a bit of a sadness I have at the moment that, that you can't, that there's very few undergraduate degrees now around, well, well for human factors specifically, there isn't. Uh, and I think that's somewhat something that we need to um, try and bring back in some way. Um, but from that piece of view, you've, been, you've, got, you've got, your, um, got your degrees and you've, been inspired by working at NAT. What's the what's the career path then? Have you always stayed in air traffic control? Have you moved around? What's the? What's the I mean, over over the course of now twenty five years, most of that time has been in air traffic management, aviation generally. Um, some some of that time has been in um, academia as well, because for a few years I was at University of New South Wales in Sydney as a senior lecturer there in aviation safety and aviation human factors. Um, so that was staying in the same kind of field. But I did a few years consulting um, in various high-risk industries, which was really useful, actually, to get out of one field and across a bunch of different ones like chemical manufacturing, uh, like water processing, sewage processing, believe it or not, um, gas storage, um, healthcare, you know, just just a whole, uh, the railways in particular. And I worked for a rail operating company in Australia for a while as well. Um, and as a consultant privately, um, a few years ago, I've done work in like border security and enough areas to give a flavor of what I was really into, um, because some of those are much more engineering based. Um, and like, for instance, um, the railways, you tend to end up on a lot of engineering projects and others are perhaps more human oriented and what I'm doing now and have done for certainly the last 12 years is more human oriented, but recognizing the full scope of human factors, of course. But okay. Yeah. I think we tend to have a, a, more of an emphasis on, let's say, human and, and, and team performance or the design of engineered systems in human factors. We tend to have an emphasis on, on one or the other. Well, I probably started with the more engineering emphasis coming out of a basically an engineering master degree, uh, going back to my roots more in psychology, probably. Cool. And is there any particular sort of, I guess, standout projects, standout moments that you think that you, that were really inspirational through your, uh, through your journey that you, that you keep on reflecting on? Mm. Um, the standout ones, and I guess they're inspirational in a way, but, um, they can, they can also sometimes be quite traumatic. Um, I, I think one really standout one was about um, a new airport tower that I was working on. Um, a major, major airport, one of the biggest in, in the world um, in terms of passenger numbers. And this was a completely new tower in a new part of the airfield, um, d double the height. Um, more positions. I mean, everything about it was different. 
air side in, um, instead of being, um, you know, kind of easily accessible from the fr from the terminal and so on. Um, and this involved so many changes to procedures, to viewing angles, safety issues such as the tower could theoretically now be in cloud, for instance. And so there's there's all sorts of issues. Um, new equipment moving from paper strips to an electronic um, version of that, electronic flight progress strips where all of the information for each aircraft is recorded uh, via touchscreens. Um, so th th this was many changes, but lots of difficult social issues, resistance to change, and quite genuine issues about just, for instance, access being difficult. Mm. Um, all sorts of issues mixed in with quite technical issues. Um, uh, so following that pro project through the latter stages when I was brought in was difficult, um, partly because I spent my first week on the project. I chose to spend it in a simulator watching the controllers, yeah. which looking back was exactly the right thing to do. Um, because from all of the documentation, the safety has a documentation. You can't get a clear picture of anything because it's so fragmented. Um, and what I could see in the simulator at the time was that the controller simply couldn't work safely. They couldn't really work at all. Um, and there was a deadline coming for this new tower to go online. Um, and so I had to report that news that, you know, the evidence that I had from observ observation was that this, these controllers were not ready. Yeah. to work safely. Um, and that led to a big chain of events where the the O date, the operational date, was moved um, by about four or five months. And in that period, a whole bunch of activities were done, shadowing more simulation, and I had to collect observation evidence through that time. And I think that really changed things for me because it was the first time, actually, that, and this was around 2007, 2008, um, around that time, 2007, I think. This was the first time that I'd really, I think, thoroughly understood the difference between workers analyzed, let's say, and workers imagined and workers done, or at least workers observed, because I was observing it and also talking to people. And yeah. work, workers disclosed, as I call that. And that was really clear the difference, you know, where you have training records, which on paper say the controllers are ready because they can do task A, task B, task C, ta and task D. And then the reality is they can't do their job. Right, okay. Um, and that highlighted so many things for me, that if you break down people's jobs into parts, as we often do, in fact, it, not very yeah. human factors, but in, in all kinds of fields, that does not equal the whole when you put those together. I.e., people can do lots of subtasks and be unable to do their job. Yeah. Uh, and it really highlighted that for me. It was also a very emotional project because it was very difficult for, con for controllers who were formerly very experienced, some of the most experienced, now couldn't use this new equipment, mm. um, had controllers having sort of post-traumatic stress dreams where they were having nightmares, actually. Oh, wow. That they never had before because there was just so much fear that I can't do this job. I, I, I'm not competent anymore. I've yes. lost my abilities. I've lost my fluidity. But I'm going to have to do this by X date. And so as a practitioner, observing this, there's so much going on because you're trying to emphasize, uh, empathize with these people, of course, but not sympathize because you don't want to get lost in their world. Because uh, that's not going to be helpful when you then go back to management with these arguments. And in fact, what I did was I wrote a letter after that week detailing what I'd seen. I didn't write a report. I actually wrote a letter. Uh, I'd never done that before, and I've never done it since. But but it was um, a very direct, honest letter about what I saw and what I thought. Um, and when I delivered the letter, a long time ago now, but when I delivered the letter, um, I was kind of, I delivered it to a couple of people, like in order of seniority, and then up to the general manager and a bunch of people in the general manager's office. Right. And what was said to me was by one person was, well, you know, they're being signed off training. You know, they seem to be 
uh, they seem to be uh, competent with it and basically denying what I experienced and observed and what I was relaying from after a week. And what I simply said was, well, have you been in the simulator? And what the person said was, no. And so I said, well, I mean, then I can't believe you're arguing with me. Yeah. Because I've just spent a week in there. So that was just like the, the, the short story is that was really emphasizing the difference between work as imagined and work as done and how the most business critical decisions are made on the basis of work as imagined. And it, 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 it took me like, what, 10 years, I, I guess, to thoroughly realize that. Yeah. And I think that is, that's such a poignant message because we talk, I mean, even to be fair that even now, maybe the, the, the phrasing works, imagine work has done, um, is trotted out quite quickly without not necessarily everybody getting the full insight into truly what that means. And I think the, the way you just described around not only getting to grips with the task, but actually the, the effect that you're having on, on the, on the users, the people themselves and being able to, um, bring them through uh through that journey because it is a journey and and i quite like that piece around the how you communicated the outcome uh i've never heard of it being done in a letter before um what inspired you to to what what was what was your thinking what what made the letter different to uh to the report that i guess that we we used to um i was upset basically that was it i was upset i was upset at seeing these controllers upset and feeling incompetent so that that was like a natural human reaction so there's no place in a profession for being upset yeah yes but i found myself upset uh and, and i i wrote the letter i remember it was a thursday night it was like and the, the next day was going to be my last day on site for the week and i remember i wrote it kind of late into the night and uh it, but he's like, well, I've no time to write a, a, a report. And anyway, reports are so easily dismissed. <laughs> yeah. And they're rarely really wanted. And they, 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 they just don't seem to make that much of an impact. And so I just wrote a, I don't know, two, three page letter. I don't suppose I've got it anymore. I'm not sure. But, um, but um, I, I, I just started to put pen to paper. Mm. And then I just went in the next day and said, look, I've got something written here. And I, it's a letter and I need to read it out to you. Uh, to the safety manager and, yeah. and he said well i think you need to read that to the atc manager and i said okay and i did that and then he said i think you need to read it to the chief general manager and it, it that, and that's how i ended up in those that situation that's really cool that that shows just the thinking about the communication path you've got can have different such a different impact to i guess what we're what we're used to we're just going to take a quick break and then we want i want to get back and have a chat with you more about how you have seen the uh, the human factors I guess the, prof the profession itself um, develop and grow. So we'll be right back after this. You are listening to Square Road 2, the Human Factors podcast. We wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for your support. You can help further by rating us through your podcast provider, sharing us through social media, and telling your friends and colleagues. Let's work together in raising awareness of the value and to users at the center of what we do. And welcome back. And I'm here talking to Stephen Shorrock about his experiences in the in the human factors profession. So, Stephen, how you you recently did a, a blog post um, on a reflection of your 25 years in in industry. Um, how have you seen, in your words, sort of the 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 industry grow and develop? What's been the big What's been the big hitters for you? So, if we're talking about human factors and ergonomics, um, then I, I guess it's grown in. In all ways, it's grown in breadth in terms of industry coverage. That's been one thing, um, though not as much as I would like to have seen. One thing that we've seen, for instance, is growth into software engineering and operations. Uh, this is a group of people working for all kinds of business uh, critical and, and sometimes safety critical um, um, web operations and engineering work. Um, doing really important work because if a website such as Google, Amazon, PayPal goes down for a few seconds, the cost is 
extraordinary, number one. But also there's, and it's not just the cost of that website, it's the cost to many, many other businesses. And, and also there are often some um, safety critical issues that are, that are often unknown. So in a number of organizations now, there are people doing human factors work. Lund, is, Lund University is, is producing quite a few graduates going into this field. So a friend of mine called John Olspaugh, uh, he's really been influential in, 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 in getting people interested in human factors and safety science. And in fact, in the book that you mentioned earlier, there's a chapter by John Olspaugh about human factors in web operations and engineering. So, so you could, ha you could um, have a look at that for an overview. So it's got into different sectors. Um, a bit more into healthcare. Um, in other sectors, possibly a bit less, such as um, mining, for instance, there used to be quite a capability in human factors or ergonomics in mining in the UK, for instance. Now where you've got a lot of mining done in developing countries and now you've not got that capability anymore, for instance, farming is another sector, for instance, where there's huge injury rates and so on. But still, we can say that at least in developed countries, there's a broadening of scope, especially into the higher technology areas. And I think there's a broadening depth as well um, in terms of the, um, the, the, the amount of topics or the number of topics that are now considered as human factors. And that's a bit of a double-edged sword. So in my day one, 25 years ago, for instance, Human factors, ergonomics were considered fairly synonymous, and um, nowadays they are sort of diverging. And there's a whole thing about human performance, human and organisational performance. In the UK, it used to be called human and organisational, or human and organisational factors in the HSE, which had a unit specialised on that. Um, but yeah, there's just a broadening of topics. I think now that's that, that that that's that's another change. In 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 another way, when I look back, for instance, in Nats Air Traffic um, Control UK, what was done twenty five years ago, it's not all that much different to what's being done now. You know, there's not in that particular sector the same sorts of things are being done, except there's just again more things being done because there's more people to, able to do more things. Well, so those tasks that haven't changed, what, how do you mean? Is that the things like task analysis and things like that? Or is it, um, is, what sort of tasks are, how, do, do you mean? So for instance, you get involved um, in the old days, like 25 years ago, you know, in somewhere like NATS, you'd get involved in things like uh, simulation, real-time simulation, for instance, maybe a bit of fast time simulation, some interface design, some interface uh, evaluation often more so because you weren't that well embedded in design teams at the time. Um, there'd be some research. We have quite a lot of research in those days, which is not being done so much now. That's what I noticed. So there's less value placed on research now. It's almost a dirty word in industry. You've got to use the word innovation. Um, Don't get me started on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you might do a bit of task analysis but i think now where it's broadened out there's a lot more what i would call human performance work which which is kind of on the border of human factors because it's things like coaching it's things like you know advice on good performance it's what i would put under the bucket of applied psychology rather than let's say human factors engineering right so do you think that's largely down to i guess the way that we do these things hasn't really changed given the technology advances and that type of thing, but actually our toolboxes are kind of the kind of the same. We we don't have um, real technological intervention here because a questionnaire is a questionnaire. A um, you know you pick up the uh, the book and use the appropriate methodologies. Um, almost not. Uh, it's irrelevant. There's been no huge step changes in somebody coming up with a a tool or an app or something to say actually we can do things differently. I guess a couple of exceptions might be eye tracking. Um, and you know them, them, them sort of sensors uh, where we can track, but they're they're also fraught with difficulty and an interpretation. Um, 
what do you think do, do you think we we've been held back or do you think actually that that is just the breadth of things we we do yeah i, I think we have a, a a general tool set of uh quantitative and qualitative methods that have hardly changed at all and so we rely on those so my basic tools are listening to people and observing people for instance they're like the two really basic tools and you can look at you can look at textbooks from all sorts of disciplines and basically the methods are basically the same um we have had advances in psychophysiological tools for things like looking at fatigue and eye movements and and so on and so that's true but we don't use them all that much apart from for very specific um for their very specific projects um so yeah those those things have not have not have not actually moved on that much we have we do have some new methods though that are more probably systemic and synthetic than the analytical methods that we've relied on more traditionally so as well as like hierarchical task analysis for instance um which is obviously analytical for instance we might now use uh methods such as fram or influence diagrams or axiomaps but even some of those like axiomaps influence diagrams they're not new either they've been around for about 25 years as well wow. uh, so so yeah there's not there's not there's not been great great leaps and bounds in in the methods for, as far as i can see and there's a there's a big problem in actually validating these methods as well in terms of how reliable they are and so i think we often overstate the importance of the method actually mm -hmm. yeah and i think there's a there's almost a, an issue there because I've I've been caught out with it myself where you pick a particular method because it gets referenced a lot, um, and you think actually it's been referenced loads. Therefore, loads of people have done some work with it. Therefore, it's brilliant. Uh, but actually, you, you you're almost in a cycle because no, you're not, not people aren't sure about what method to use, so they do exactly the same thing, and you end up using the same method even though it could be you know it gives you a half decent answer, but actually there might be better things out there. We just haven't got that evidence there to say actually yes, let's go with it. Or the budget and ability, because as you said, research is is becoming a bit of a dirty word. Uh, the ability to actually say, right, I want to use this technique and this capability. Industry doesn't have the margin there to be able to uh, to do that sort of work. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's exactly right. And there's a disconnect also between research and practice. Uh, there are methods that are cited quite a lot in research that are not used at all in practice. I mean, zero. Typically, these are methods that, let's say I develop a method, and then I'm going to write a lot of papers based on the use of this method for particular case studies. That yeah. doesn't mean that anybody else uses it at all. So that doesn't really give you a good base unless you've got perhaps lots of different people doing studies with the method. Um, even then, it doesn't tell you an awful lot about the real quality of the methods we're still using some quite old-fashioned methods in human factors that are really rooted in um safety language that's very negative and therefore very limited mm -hmm. so almost all of the methods for instance that are based on uh, error analysis are based around very negative categories and yeah. uh, and that's 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 problematic that's problematic um as well but relatively easy to resolve okay yeah because i guess there is that whole i think i get my issue with some safety stuff is we try and get we're trying to push down for a microscopic number um and people who don't necessarily understand the the work that goes into the background of these things just look at that number and say well why isn't it smaller um and fo without focusing really on what that number truly means um in the program um but I guess that is something that, that needs to evolve over time. Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier um, with the, that, the, 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 um, the project you, you mentioned and also, I guess, alluded to is we, we rarely get into a project at the beginning. Um, it's always, I also allude to it as firefighting. We, we come in when it, you know, it goes wrong. We've kind of lost that juicy bit right at the beginning when we could have made some real impact, but actually now it's broken. We need to fix it. Um, why do we still struggle? Uh, well, why do organizations still struggle, I guess, to take us seriously and get us involved right at the beginning? Mm. So many reasons for that. There aren't, there, there aren't actually that many of us. 
Yeah, that's true. So um, th that's one reason. Uh, and if there aren't that many of you, then there's not many of you to make your case for why this should be included. Another reason is organizations typically do what they, in safety critical sector anyway, they do what they have to do according to regulation. And incorporating human factors in design is quite rarely one of those things that's yeah. specified. Um, and so, and so that, that, that's then another, another, another reason. It's quite hard to make a business case because you're trying to um, say, well, they'll say, well, what, what's going to be the benefit? And well, you're trying to look into the future then. And, and as you say, you could provide numbers, but even those are just estimates of based, based on techniques of human reliability, which are of really questionable validity. When you look at the data sources, they don't, they're, they're in, they're, they're, they're not coming from a place that's necessarily in anything like what you're applying them to. Um, we also don't really have a strong design capability. Most of us that come into this profession don't come in from a design degree. Mm -hmm. We come in mostly from psychology or engineering, but without having had done design engineering, um, or we come in from biological sciences, or we come in from frontline roles. Now, none of those are really design oriented. A few come in from design degrees. Uh, they're relatively rare. Mm. And when you look in a typical book of human factors methods, few of the methods are design oriented. Yeah. They're mostly about user research and um, systems practice, systems thinking methods, for instance, uh, and just a whole bunch of analytical methods and qualitative methods and, and, and so on. So rarely will you find that. And I think it just reflects that we don't have um, as much design capability as we might need compared to, for instance, a product designer. Right. Who might not have as much background in human factors. So we should be working together, but that's not, that doesn't, doesn't always happen. But also the, the, I guess the fashionable, um, or the, the, the newly emerging, uh, role is around UX and UX design and, and that type of thing. And there's been lots of discussions around how, you know, is UX just part of human factors or is it part of ergonomics? Is it part of, you know, are we closely aligned or are we just standing on each other's turf? What's your view on, on the, uh, on the influx of UX into the market? So again, this is a sector where there is design capability, uh, in, in, um, but not necessarily the the level of formal education in human factors, ergonomics, uh, human computer interaction, usability, and all of those things. And the emphasis is, I guess, UX field would say much broader. Um, the certification is obviously much less because you can pretty much go in as you know. You, there's no need to be certified, and if you do get certified, you can do that in a few days. I got a certification in. UX foundations, for instance, international certification in about three three days, something like right. that. Yeah, you know, just is just as a trial to see what is what is this about, and and that was basically about um, um, human centered design using the ISO standard. Yeah. Um. Very basically, you know, at a very basic kind of level. Uh, I think that's then for some kind of web applications and yeah, some digital applications that. That, that might be okay. Certainly not okay to be going into any kind of security, um, safety, business critical applications. Yeah. I think the emphasis is also a bit different because the emphasis is on typically the user. My emphasis is on a whole bunch of stakeholders. The user of some electronic equipment, for instance, uh, that's one of them, mm -hmm. but there are a bunch of others as well. So you can optimize for the user and make the system as a whole worse. That's quite possible. Uh, also within UX, you have things like, well, there's an infiltration of marketing and I think there's an infusion of the two things. And so whether it's good for the user or good for profits is, is, is a question and who's driving the, those kind of priorities 
typically in human factors, we're probably more aligned, most of us, towards protection. Yeah. And probably in UX, there's a different kind of, there's a different emphasis, really. And so we have that in the back of our, in, in, the, in the back of our mind, just because of where human factors has come from, you know, going back to the Second World War. Mm. Yeah, I've sort of always had this now of forming a firmer idea that human factors is more grounded in safety and, and reaches back into standards and things like that with a view to producing something that is functional and safe and, you know, will do the job it's going to do. Uh, whereas UX more as a top-down approach of it's going to delight our user because of, as you say, that they're looking, um, how do we sell things? How do we sell the next version of things? Um, and not necessarily reaching down into actually is it safe to use and uh, i kind of feel that there's got to be some sort of coalition between the two um they do you know that is because when we do it designing military systems we don't exactly say well does this delight our user um largely the military user couldn't care less uh, does it do the job uh, but maybe we need to think more in that that domain more military users are sitting there going well this is nothing like my iphone why am i using a mapping system that isn't like google etc cetera, etc cetera. um so it, I think it, it is an interesting developing relationship, but I don't know. I don't know. Certainly, don't know what the answer is quite yet. Um, we, uh, you with uh, we've mentioned the book already, uh, but you with uh, Claire Williams published uh, Human Facts and Ergonomics in Practice, and you are you're a prolific bro uh, blogger, and you on Twitter you don't like LinkedIn, um, and uh, but what what are your thoughts on how we as a profession communicate because Obviously, we, you know, doing this type of on, on this this type of platform, um, we still don't see that many um, practitioners on here sharing. There isn't that many of us. What can we be doing? What what should we be doing as a profession? Do you think? Probably doing a lot better than we than, than we were, you know. Um, but um, I think what we need to recognise is that the attention economy has totally changed. People now have much less motivation to read long reports for instance to read long white papers to read books even i mean i'm working on a book you know myself but it's like yeah there's there's not that much motivation anymore for people to to read because social media such as twitter such as linkedin is just taking so much of that um so much of people's attention um so so uh, so i guess on, on, on in one way we have to go to where the people are and, and that's where that's why i chose twitter really because i thought well who do i want to communicate with and primarily it's not people like me really right. that's my secondary group actually and that's why i chose twitter as 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 where i would give most of my time because there you'll find for instance lots of healthcare practitioners nurses doctors um you know um paramedics and so on um less so pilots and air traffic controllers actually but they they're not they're they're not they they seem to be um less involved in using social media professionally full stop um, but there i might find some of more, more of them on on um linkedin for sure for instance yeah. um and linkedin you'll find more obviously safety professionals and human factors professionals and so on but um so I, that, that's one thing blogging i mean when when i first heard of blogging i wasn't convinced by it at all i just thought this is just people just saying anything i mean it could be anyone which was a kind of snobbish attitude of myself at the time because it's like and then i realized that well the peer review for blogging is other people online yeah right so i can write an article a brief piece and you get feedback straight away. People can agree with it. They can disagree with it. They can write to you. They can write their own blog piece. They can, you know, they can respond in any way. They can leave a comment. And uh, unless they're abusive, which they never are, I'll publish the comments, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, I think people are attracted to shorter pieces that are, that, that are going to, um, that they, they're guaranteed that they're going to get value from rather than okay here's a journal article i can see the abstract is it going to be useful for me to invest half a day or whatever reading this journal article which i will probably have to buy 
Yeah. Uh, and I just thought that's not a model that I can really go along with that much anymore. Um, so, so yeah, but that that's where I just think more di- more directness and more immediacy in communication is 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 probably better. Do you think there's a potential issue though? Because as you sort of said, if you've got a book or you've got an article, the, the long form um, is you know, it is a, a, an authority of sort, but we've, we're moving to things now. So we, I'm experimenting things like with short, you know, one minute or a couple of minutes of information thrown at people as people doom scroll through, um, you know, uh, TikTok and, and things like that. Is there going to be is, is, or a balance between trying to find the right sort of communication profiles as opposed to the the considered, the the well reviewed, the well researched. If you've got somebody like say me, I can just go and chuck something on TikTok and people might accidentally think that I know what I'm talking about. Um whereas, you know, you've got your the the, the books that have been written. What's the balance to be struck? It's no different in human factors than it is in any other where you have people talking about nutrition. Probably much of it is not very good quality evidence or advice on on TikTok, I don't know. Um, or on any other aspect of, of healthcare or, or, or anything else. It's not much different to that. And um, that's quite difficult because you're not going to be judged necessarily on the quality of the advice or information, but the presentation and it yeah. is, is, is going to be crucial to the engagement of that, much more so, actually. Um, we still need all of the scientific journal articles and so on. That's still massively needed i mean in, in healthcare as an example that's seen as much more necessary than for instance in aviation where okay what's the quality of the evidence you know i, I think though sometimes we put too much value on those two reviewers when okay so you could still write something for a, a blog post and that's now got potentially hundreds of reviewers leaving short reviews on Twitter or short reviews on on, on anything, for instance. Uh, the line that I would draw is if I was presenting some empirical data or something really quite complicated that needed that really detailed review by a fellow specialist, then I would turn to a journal for that. But most of my writings are not of that nature. And so I don't, I don't need to. And in fact, much of what's written in journals just simply doesn't need to be written in journals. And it could be at least open access somewhere. Yeah. So yeah, this, 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 there's, there's a balance to be had. We'll always need books. We'll always probably need journal articles. Um, but going back again 25 years, well, there was no internet, really. Um, not, not, <laughs> nothing like what we would call the internet now. And, um, and so that, that balance has, has changed. Do you think there could be, and this is completely off my head, so uh, off the top of my head, um, when we write articles, oh, sorry, when we write um, either journal articles or conference papers and things, we we have to we obviously have to write the abstract, we have to write our keywords, and you write your article. Do you think there maybe should be some sort of thing about recording, you know, the two minute video, the um, that sort of thing, to then make it more accessible um, out there? So broadening what we need to do on the scientific basis to make it accessible. Um, or would it just distract, distract well, from the quality of science? It, it could be useful. You're still competing now for, atten- for attention. But um, I think what people want to know is what really what is the so what for me of this? They want, they want that bottom line up front, that bluff to use the military term. Um, that's what people want now, I believe. And, and you don't want to have to pay to get that. You want to have that kind of first and and then later you can kind of work read about how how they got to that um so if it presents those things then that's probably quite attractive and that's what it should focus on it shouldn't just deliver probably a traditional abstract which you can just read yourself it should be going to the um implications i would say cool okay um because i guess that is a big problem that we do have now is there are so many experts on facebook and twitter um, or so-called experts that we need to be able to, if you've got to put that information out there, you've got to put it in a way that commands authority and and shows that, that actually this is good stuff and it's been reviewed, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that is a, a challenge going forward. Um, 
So within, so go, I guess reflecting back over the, the 25 years, but looking forward, um, where do you see the discipline going in the future? What sort of exciting things do you think could be out there, given, the, given that we've already sort of maybe hinted at the fact that nothing much has changed really in the terms of methodologies and things like that? Do you see any big, big changes coming up or is it just business as usual? Obviously, changes in, well, the changes in many different contexts, it's, it's worth looking at it like that. So there's going to be obviously changes in the technological context, and these are accelerating. Uh, and we somehow need to keep up to be useful, uh, to be useful and to be included yeah. uh, in that. There's going to be obviously societal changes in terms of um, aging and so on. There's all sorts of other changes in terms of, well, the kind of peace landscape and, and so on, and, and how do we... How do, how do we get involved in that? We've got human factors in uh, military, but can we have human factors in other aspects of, um, of, of life that might contribute to, uh, to peace and to stability in the kind of more systemic view, uh, viewpoint and perspective that, that, that we have? Probably shouldn't be forgotten that in the developing world, 25 years ago, the state of human factors in the developed uh, countries would be a huge luxury. Yeah. So um, we, we, we've still got farming. I mean, that's always going to be needed all around the world. Um, it's um, hugely problematic for people and also for the environment and so on. And there's going to be continued extraction of raw materials and so on. So there's lots of primary and secondary industries logging and and so on that that I go that, that still need that really fundamental um let's say ergonomics support and human factors support um so we shouldn't we shouldn't forget that in getting so wrapped up in the in the technology thinking that that's what it's all about um things like somehow reprioritizing where we are as well because if you look at the most dangerous industries human factors is in many ways the least well integrated into them which doesn't make sense so there's no easy way to do that except by probably by the help of regulation hmm. but when when you look at things like um well healthcare i mean is it is really obvious the nhs is a organization of around 1.4 million and the number of full-time human factors, qualified experienced human factors specialists can be counted on certainly two hands, not counting people that do a bit on the side of their main clinical role, but full-time equivalents. Yeah. You know, you might have pushing it 10 people, one in a million. Yeah. That's hugely problematic. You know, that's not to say anything about farming, about fishing, about extraction, logging, all of these kinds of, all of these kinds of things. So that would be nice to see. Whereas ultra safe industries typically are quite well well represented by by human factor specialists. But I guess what what I what I think might also happen is I think there could be a split similar to what happened in psychology, um, where human factors is split. In, into subfields, really, more formally. So seeing more of the, yeah, so some of the subfields that we have out in, in here and, and the US, I guess, the they could be more recognized within their own own sectors. So I, do, do you think that will dilute the overall human factors approach so we focus more on the subgroups? Well, the kind of subgroups I mean, uh, I mean, fundamentally, there's a difference between human factors engineering and, let's say, human performance support. I mean, the, those are not great things, but the human factors engineering is really focused on designing technical systems and the human performance support is 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 focused on um, supporting individuals and, and teams to do their to do, to do their job. And that's quite a fundamental difference. There's actually very little that connects those apart from an overall philosophy. And our philosophy used to be something to do with um fitting the task to the person right fitting the job to the person yeah um bending metal rather than twisting arms but 
a lot of what's done in human factors, when you look at, for instance, crew resource management, threat and error management, and lots of different training applications, coaching applications, that's based on more, in a way, fitting the human to the environment. And even now, when we look at resilience engineering, um, many of applications here are actually about supporting people's expertise, supporting their ability to work in teams, supporting their ability to be flexible within an overall system. So that's two, two different things connected by some kind of vague philosophy in common, but we call it all human factors and that in a way dilutes, well, what are you actually doing? Because it's just anything with a human. And then the psychologists come along and say, well, hang on a minute, we've been doing that for years, you know, and, um, and so on. So I, I can see maybe some splits in that, in, in those, and that might make sense actually that you're someone, for instance, you, Barry, you, you focus much more on the engineering side, mm -hmm. right? And that's your specialty and your background as an engineer before you went into human factors. Myself, I came into human factors as a psychologist, dipped my toes in engineering, but then it's like, well, actually, I prefer the more psychology-oriented and systems thinking applications. We naturally, I think, tend to go into one camp or the other. I think that's a natural kind of thing. I think that... Um... And potentially that might make the entire discipline stronger in its own right, because we, I know it's a discussion we've had and I've definitely had with others where you sort of turn around and say, well, yes, I'm a human factors practitioner, um, but what flavor are you? And, and do I need to know everything that there is about um, your side of the camp in order to do my job effectively? Um, and perhaps that is a, that could be a, a journey of maturity. Uh, within within our standard, because we still get get classed, I guess, as the teenager discipline. But you have, you know, I'm, I, we talk we talked about engineering quite a lot. I'm an engineer, but I'm not a civil engineer. I'm not an electrical engineer, and and that doesn't hurt my. I'm still happy to be called an engineer, but I'm also recognise my own discipline. So that's a really interesting thought to take us forward. Um, right, we're going to take a quick break here, and then we're going to get into the final three questions that uh, that we ask everybody. So we're back right after this. Just before Barry gets to the final three, my name's Nick Rome. Let me tell you about this. Technology in our world is evolving at a phenomenal pace. And keeping up with what that means in the human factors world can be challenging. That's where Human Factors Cast comes in. Human Factors Cast is a weekly podcast that highlights and breaks down stories that are chosen by you, the human factors community. New York State is giving out hundreds of robots as companions for the elderly. Buttons in cars are safer and quicker to use than touch street. A prototype just achieved a major milestone that actually fits the description of a flying car. The show provides perspective based on experiences from different domains and different industries. We even cover some of the hottest conferences in the field. On this episode, we're recapping EHF, Ergonomics and Human Factors Conference, Neuroergonomics Conference, Human Factors and Ergonomics Society, uh, UXPA International, Join me, Nick Rome. And me, Barry Kirby. Every Friday morning when Human Factors Cast drops on YouTube and your favorite podcast directory. And remember, it, it depends. And now I'm going to send it back over to Barry for the final three. I shouldn't laugh, but that's the first. I already finished cutting the advert about 10 minutes before the start of this interview. And um, yeah, that makes me think. Um so, yeah, so we asked these final three questions, a standard for everybody, just really as a, a lighthearted um, finish to the interview. But do you have a, a go to, and you can choose your own if you want, that's fine. Uh, but do you have a go to book or paper that you use repeatedly? Um, can be technical or it could be a fiction book. Not that I use repeatedly. And I, I think there's not because I'm always coming on to new things, especially as an editor. I'm always receiving new magazine articles and so on. And so there's not one I would go typically go back to but if i rephrase the question which would i put into a time capsule which is maybe a question you could use which would i put into a time uh, ca capsule that would be lisanne bainbridge uh, ironies of automation paper because i think if you put it in a time capsule it is it doesn't matter when you open this in the future it's it's still going to be relevant and it's it's a desert island paper as far as i'm uh, concerned so i don't particularly need to go back for it partly because i've almost pretty much memorized the premises of it so yes okay mentally i do um yeah. but yeah that that would be the one that would be the desert island paper the time capsule paper 
I might actually, I'm going to steal that for a future question. So thank you very much. Um, but that's interesting, isn't it? Because doing what you do in terms of um, editing magazines and books and papers and things like that, um, you must see an awful lot of content go over your desk. Um, how do you how do you keep track of it all in that respect? Um, with great difficulty, because <laughs> that is not a natural skill of mine. I'm an artist and a writer and, a, and an editor primarily, um, but but keeping track of multiple um reviews versions that that is quite hard so you have to just set up a system to nice. just to cope with all of those because each article is not just peer reviewed by two uh fellow scientists it's actually read reviewed some detail or not by uh, about um 10 um people operational people who could choose to give um feedback and some of them might like it, some of them might hate it, and I've got to navigate why that is and make decisions as to whether this article should be included. Yeah, yeah. Go on, I can see that being um, just a, a huge challenge. Um, if you could, if you go back and meet um, younger Stephen um, at, at whatever point in life you, you choose, what advice would he give your younger self? I think I, think I did, actually. Really, so there's there's nothing that there's nothing that I re regret so much. But I think it would be something like um, to use your gift and move in the direction in which you're most gifted. Okay, naturally. So I mean, everybody has kind of gifts, and they're the kind of things that your you know mother or father would say naturally gifted at now my mother's not alive anymore but she would have said the young Stephen was gift the gifted artist that's primarily and a writer that's what i was and she would have been really surprised to find out that i ended up in engineering kind of very engineering related projects at the time in the railways and in air traffic you know at the, at the time um and she would she would probably say like well what happened to all of the art that you you know you, that you used to do so i guess at a certain point particularly when i came into euro control where you got having a, a great manager as well and an environment where this creativity was encouraged so i just started to reincorporate graphic design into my work through things like discussion cards through through presentations through magazine where i assist with the graphic design and so on and through writing more creatively on a broad blog, which is very different to writing for a scientific article, for instance. Um, so yeah, it would be just to work out what your gifts are uh, and what your passions are and try to align those rather than just looking at what you're skilled at, what you can, what you can do. Yeah. Uh, but, but thankfully I did start doing that, but that was probably about like, you know, 10, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then finally, once you've retired and um, sat at home, what would you like to be remembered for? I suppose that depends if it's on a personal or professional uh, basis, really. But the answers might be the same. The answer might be um, about being uh, being authentic and being um, helpful, probably. Um, so, so yeah, that that applies. You know, that applies probably personally and, and professionally. But yes, um, yes. partly that's just about being honest uh, in all aspects of life, you know. So if I'm asked a question at work and I think, well, I don't, I don't want to be saying, well, what answer do people want? You know, I want to say, well, this is, this, is, this is now genuinely what I think, even if it makes me unpopular at this time, mm. right? Which was like the story that I gave you earlier, right? Because that was definitely the wrong answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though the result was that the airport, the new tower opened four months later with no delay and all of the stakeholders were happy as so long as there was minimal impact on them, you know. So so prob probably that and just um, be being authentic and being um, of service, I, I think, to, to, to others. Brilliant. Um, well, that's it for this, for this episode. I'd like to say thank you, Stephen, for sharing uh, your thoughts, your insights and your experiences with us today. If people want to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? Well, if if you're on Twitter, that's 
kind of obvious. You can do that by via Twitter uh, if you're on LinkedIn. Um, I, I'm I'm less on LinkedIn, but I do I do log in every few days. Um, you can do it via, via LinkedIn or my blog, which would be contact at humanisticsystems.com would be the email address. Perfect. And the contact details for Stephen are also on the um, on the show notes of, of this episode. So thank you all for listening and or watching, depending on what medium you're uh, you're engaging with us with. And we hope to see you all on the next episode. <laughs> thank you for listening to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. Please do get in touch with your friends, questions and comments. You can look at us on social media such as Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook at 1202 Podcast. See you next time. And remember, it's more than just common sense.